Hello. Hello. How are you all doing? We're late. I'm a minute late. People were rushing in. How are you guys doing today? How many of you guys came to my show? Violin show. Okay. That's most of you. All right. That entire violin show is just an elaborate cover story for this lecture, okay? <laughs> the lecture is on the Da Vinci Code. I do have to, um, hold on a second. I do have to find one thing, okay. My magic clicker, let's see if this works. Okay, a lot of people, you know, I, I just added this to the, to the Da Vinci Code lecture. A lot of people afterwards ask me, what is the relationship between you playing the violin and the Da Vinci Code? And I thought about this for a while, and there is one connection. There is a relationship between the two. Um, as you saw at the show, I started very, very young, but I was mentored by Dvorak, the great-granddaughter of Antonin Dvorak, the, the, the famous 19th century uh, violist. And her great-granddaughter was the Concert Master Chicago Symphony. And very early on, uh, my teachers would send me out to do shows around Chicago. This is my first probably big show. There's around 10,000 people there. My sister is behind the piano. So she, that's why she always was like, I never got billing. Um, <laughs> I was always the one standing on stage. But because of this event, because of the fact that I was doing all these shows, I was fairly well known in the state of Illinois. Okay, and this actually occurred. I, I'm not, this, is, this is crazy that, that this happened, but the state of Illinois back then, this is when computers were first coming out. I actually, in, what, what's today, September what, 30th? I turned 45 years old in three days, okay? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, back in 1982, I had started kindergarten, and the state of Illinois, instead of sending me to kindergarten, they took me out of the normal public school and they put me in a cubicle, and they taught me how to program advanced computer code. I was the only, kindergartner in the country, and possibly even in the world, learning advanced computer code. They wanted to see what it would do to the mental development of a child if they ran this experiment. And it made the cover of Chicago Sun Times, as you can see there. That's me. <laughs> what? Yeah, I was a living experiment. What's, what's interesting about that living experiment is they never contacted me later <laughs> to see what happened. You're about to see what happened. <laughs> so my life kind of had two paths. It was the public path where I was a violin player, and I've been doing shows for 40 years. And then there was the path where I started seeing patterns in the data, and this became something that just was a regular part of my life. I always looked for patterns in the data, and when it came to Leonardo da Vinci, I really didn't think that there was anything there. I was studying ancient literature, and um, how many of you guys have seen the film, The Da Vinci Code? Okay, and read the book. That's almost all of you, okay. Um, the only thing true about that film is the title, okay. I wasn't studying Da Vinci and the uh, Code. I was studying ancient literature. But one thing that there is to note about The Da Vinci Code when I saw the book and the film, and it's taken kind of intellectual scrutiny off of um, uh, Da Vinci, when you mention the Da Vinci Code in universities around the country, the professor's eyes just glass over. They, 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 they all, all intellectual criticism on the code has been taken off the table, and I think largely because of the book and the film. But one thing that we do know for sure is that Leonardo da Vinci painted secrets into his masterworks. This is an historical truth. There's no way around this. You can see from this painting, and there are extra limbs beneath the table. That part was true. I think there is a dagger somewhere. I, I forget where that is. A, a recently, though, a very interesting um, feature of this painting was brought to light. Do you guys see the bread rolls on the table? <laughs> Do you see that? OK. They're arranged in a non-haphazard way. Um, a musician, a composer, actually drew staff lines on the table and realized that Leonardo da Vinci had painted into this painting a secret piece of music. Those bread rolls play counterpoint. There's no 
possible way that Leonardo da Vinci did that by accident. He knew music, he knew counterpoint, and it does appear as if he has painted. It even plays a melody. It's a liturgical melody from kind of like the music of the day. So Leonardo da Vinci has painted secrets into his masterworks, and you can see in the middle there, something's going on. You know, there is some controversy over whether, in, in the academic world, there is controversy over whether um, he's painting a, a, a secret relationship between Jesus and the, the, the whoever is sitting next to him. Now, standard conventional wisdom has that as the beloved John. Okay, and there's two theories about this. Some, but there obviously you probably know the theory that that's actually Mary Magdalene because it's a very effeminate-looking character. But John was described as a fairly effeminate person. So the other theory is equally controversial. <laughs> that that actually is John. Okay, but the bottom line is there are secrets that Leonardo da Vinci has painted into his masterworks. And if there is a secret painted into any one of his masterworks, there's certainly one in the Mona Lisa. Um, this painting is not the most famous image on earth for no reason. We don't obsess about this painting on our own. The reason why so many people consider this, and it is the most famous painting in the world, is because Leonardo da Vinci himself obsessed about this painting. How many of you guys have been to the Louvre? Okay, what's the first thing that you notice about the Mona Lisa? It's so small, it's tiny. Okay, that's actually significant. Um, da Vinci carried this painting around with him everywhere he went for the final years of his life. And spectral analysis has shown that he was obsessed about the expression on her face. He touched that up and retouched that up on many occasions. That's, that's the part of the painting that he wanted to get just right. And when we look at that, a lot of people say it's a young woman with a subtle smile, right? That's how it's described. But it's not really a subtle smile. It's not. Expressions are universal. It's interesting, across culture and across time. Everywhere, this means yes and this means no. And it's kind of weird how that is. Nothing else is cross-cultural like that. Clothing, food, culture, um, um, aesthetic value. But this means I don't know everywhere, <laughs> okay? And that expression is very specific. It's not a smile. What is it? It's a smirk. And a smirk is completely different than a smile. It conveys a completely different message. A smirk says, I know something you don't. And that's the message that da Vinci is trying to get right here in the Mona Lisa. And of all of the documentaries and books and films that I have researched on this image, only one place I have ever found that actually got the secret right, that got the anomaly in the painting right. Da Vinci has painted a very interesting feature into this painting. And the only person who ever pinpointed this that I have seen is the curator at the Louvre. This lady on the right here is the curator at the Louvre and she was asked about this image and this is what she had to say. It was very, very, very busy. He had commissions, he started paintings, he didn't finish them, he went on to something else, traveled. Remember the traveling took a long time. He took the Mona Lisa with him wherever he went, and he left work unfinished all the time. You said he took the Mona Lisa with him wherever he went? It, it, we know that the Mona Lisa traveled with him. It's one of the paintings that traveled uh, that he liked to have with him. Okay. If you tell me that Da Vinci hand carried the Mona Lisa with him everywhere, I want to know why. Was he protecting something bigger than the painting itself? The Mona Lisa features a seated woman with a subtle smile. This seemingly simple image is possibly the most widely recognized and studied piece of art in the history of the world. It's estimated to be worth more than $700 million. But could there be more to this painting than meets the eye? This isn't a novel. Could the Mona Lisa be the key to crack a code that spans Da Vinci's life's work? There's water in the background of the Mona Lisa, isn't there? That's right, yes. Because there's lower water on one side and higher water on the other. There are different kinds of landscapes, and there is a figure in the middle, so that the, the, they don't combine completely if you remove the figure. If you remove the figure, there would be a deluge of water from one side or the other. 
The background of the Mona Lisa looks like a beautiful nature scene. But look closer. The water is clearly higher on one side than the other, as though a flood is inevitable. And here's the thing. If you pull the Mona Lisa out of the painting, the waters come crashing together. The only thing stopping the flood is the alleged self-portrait. So again, we have to ask, could the Mona Lisa be part of a larger story? Okay. I'm excited, I forgot my microphone. Okay, did you guys catch that? It's the water. He's painted large bodies of water into the mountains behind her. Uh, she's, she's sitting there positioned in the valley, okay? And she has this expression on her face like she knows something you don't know, just dripping with that expression. And yet, she's about to be the victim of a giant flood. If you look over her left shoulder, and right shoulder, you can see over her left shoulder, it's very, very clear, especially in the fade of painting, you can see this pathway, do you see that? And the pathway leads right up to the lip of the water. He's painted this extreme potential energy into the painting. The water is poised to flood into the valley where the Mona Lisa is positioned looking at you like she knows it's coming. Has anybody noticed this? No, very few people have even noticed that that, that that feature is in the Mona Lisa, even the people who've been to the Louvre, they don't talk about it. Now, in order to understand the secrets of the Da Vinci Code, as I told you, I didn't start here. I started at the beginning. And when I talk about the beginning, I mean the real beginning, the beginning of human beings on planet Earth, homo sapiens, that's us, okay? In the history of humans, we began, human beings began our journey on Earth in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we lived there for a very long period of time. In fact, most of the time that humans have been on Earth, that's where we lived, okay? And there's been three major inflection points, three major turning points in the history of human beings. We've heard of two of them, most of you have heard of two of them, the historical revolution, that's when we learned how to read and write, and we started writing things down, that made a very big shift. Before that, 9500 BC, around 11,000 years ago, was the agricultural revolution. Most of you have heard of the agricultural revolution. It's when human beings shifted from hunting and gathering to raising animals and plants in captivity. And that's how we all live now, as agriculturalists. Everyone in this room is an agriculturalist, okay? We go to the buffet for food. <laughs> we don't fish off the back. Although that would be fun. They should do that. Um, but before the agricultural revolution, okay, in fact, this is to scale, 40,000 years ago, there was an event called the cognitive revolution. And anthropologists only began to pinpoint this within the last several decades. The cognitive revolution is probably the most dramatic turning point in our history. Before the cognitive revolution, there's never been a single piece of art ever discovered anywhere in the world. That's how they know that it happened. But all of a sudden, 40,000 years ago, everything we know of as art suddenly explodes onto the scene. And subsequent to that event, humans, our ancestors, exploded out of their ancestral territory and started taking large chunks of the earth from the Neanderthals. This was like Lord of the Rings. We had this enemy. Humans were confined to this small space. And we tried to make incursions into the Neanderthal territory on many occasions, but had been beaten back until this event occurred. And what we know about the event is that we started painting, making art, paintings, okay? This was the most, the uh, oldest paintings that we'd ever discovered when it was discovered in 1924. This is, what you're looking at here is the Grand Gallery of Lascaux Cave. It was discovered by lost school children. They wandered away from their school and they, they actually were playing hooky from school and they wandered into what's one of the most significant discoveries of the 20th century. And most of the scholarship on this is focused just on the paintings themselves. The paintings are exquisite and there's 1,500 of them. This is just the main gallery, but the cave goes on for uh, hundreds of thousands of feet. It's an enormous cave system, and there's, there's animals all through it, over 1,500 animals, okay? In fact, Picasso went into this cave and left exclaiming that the art of painting had not progressed in 20,000 years. That's how exquisite the paintings were. So all of a sudden, this incredible gallery of animals, and that's all scientists thought was going on here 
until recently. Scientists went back into the cave and realized that these weren't just paintings of animals. Embedded within the paintings was the entire night sky. Everything that we know of as astrology, in fact, begins here. All of the constellations, the Taurus, the Zodiac sign, Pisces, Scorpio, they're all embedded within the art. And that was just the first layer. Biologists went into the cave and realized that some of the dots, in fact, a lot of the dots, the majority of the dots and circles and markings weren't constellations at all. This was one of the main paintings in Lascaux Cave that allowed for this incredible breakthrough to take place. A biologist noticed, do you see those dots at the bottom there? Okay, this is probably a horse. It looks like a horse. They think this is a horse. And you can see that there is two major color gradients in this horse. They're not just painting animals, they were painting animals doing specific things. This animal is transitioning its color, okay? An event that occurs in the fall. And what they noticed was that they were counting the months in the year, and that circle was the window of time during the year, and then the months go on. They were counting the months from the winter solstice, from the shortest day of the year, to when the events would occur. Lasco Cave wasn't just an incredible, exquisite collection of paintings. It represented thousands of years of meticulously calculated herding, mating, migrating, falling patterns of wild animals. Just in 2007, the Polish Academy of Scientists finally released the, the first report. The reason why our scientists didn't know this until recently is because our science didn't know that there was a lunar component to animal behavior until recently. In 2007, the Polish Academy of Sciences published the first comprehensive study of this kind and found that all of us actually, I used to think that astrology was completely, I get in so many arguments with girlfriends of mine, that astrology was completely bunk. And now you, we've realized that almost every cell in your body actually follows a lunar rhythm. The hemolymphin honeybees, for example, followed a perfect 29 and a half day rhythm. They've charted homicide and suicide rates of human beings, in fact, worldwide. I don't know if many of you know this, but the homicide and suicide rates of human beings worldwide, when charted, follows a perfect lunar rhythm. And this has been going on for centuries and centuries. Every single animal in the world, in fact, all the plants, all the insects, the hatching of insects, the flowering of plants, they all follow a lunar and solar pattern. And they were tracking that pattern. Now, this is Lascaux Cave in southern France. Okay, as I said, after human beings, our ancestors, discovered that they could track the animals against the sun and the moon, this is what gave them their advantage against the Neanderthals. This is what gave the human beings their, their ability to take very large quantities of resources. And they began doing that, and they exploded out of their ancestral territory. And as we know, as you can see on the map, since humans began there in Sub-Saharan Africa, they began migrating around the planet. They crossed the Bering Strait somewhere around 25,000 years ago. Then they started migrating down the western, you know, seaboard and came to Brazil around 13,000 years ago. We know that because scientists recently discovered a mastodon tusk with a mastodon carved in it. And we know that those went extinct 13,000 years ago. But at the very last point of human migration, our ancestors, Homo sapiens, ended up in Patagonia. And you can see why. That was the very last place on the major continents that we migrated to. And as soon as they got there, they made a gigantic cave painting called the Cave Pants. They did the same thing they did in Lascaux down there in Patagonia. And I've been to over 100 countries in the world tracking this down. Not very long ago, I was in Patagonia, and I was absolutely astonished when I shot and captured this photo. Hmm. Okay, this is from the Cave of Hands. In fact, down there, if anybody who's been to Ushuaia, come to Mars, I know that a lot of you guys will be traveling, some of you have definitely been there. When you get off the ships or when you get off the plane, you go into the cities, what you find is that these images are everywhere. All the curio shops, I went to a curio shop, every single plate had images of animals with dots and circles on them. They're from the Cave of Hands. That's what dominates the artistic landscape of Patagonia, in fact. And I asked the locals, what do the dots and circles mean? And they said they're just decorations. All over the town, animals and dots and circles, and they think that the dots and circles are just decorations. The museums haven't even caught up to this new knowledge. But that's not the only relationship between Lascaux Cave and Cave of Hands. 
Here, oh, if you put the two together, I don't know, you guys see any similarities there? <laughs> Here is Lascaux Cave. It's a hunting scene, and you can see why they painted this into Lascaux Cave, because that's what their whole point, was to make animals easier to hunt. Here's a scene from the Cave of Hands. Here's a scene from Lascaux <laughs> Cave. Here's a scene from the Cave of Hands. Identical. They weren't just tracking animals, they were tracking animals in the exact same way. In fact, Lascaux Cave was considered the oldest cave that we had ever discovered with paintings in it uh, when it was discovered. But shortly after Lascaux Cave was discovered, a much older cave was also discovered in France that dated to 32,000 BC. And it was discovered, these paintings were the oldest known on Earth, and a documentary film crew uh, led by Warner Herzog, you probably know who that is, just recently, for the first time, took a film crew into Chauvet Cave. And I snapped this photo from that documentary. 32,000 BC, the exact same thing. And you can see there all 12 dots of the lunar year, okay? Also in Chauvet, though, were the most stunning images, I think, of antiquity. Remember, these are 32,000 years old. This image here is of rhinos, okay? It's an exquisite painting. Um, and again, up until they made this discovery, in fact, the people who are curators of this cave still don't know what's going on here because the discovery hasn't made its way around the world. But these aren't just rhinos. They're rhinos doing something very specific. These two rhinos in the bottom are squaring off. You can even see they kind of painted an angry face onto the one, right? <laughs> They're squaring off for battle. And in the upper right corner, you can see that motion that they painted into it. They're agitated, okay? This event is the mating season. This is the mating ritual. Males square off against each other in the mating ritual and fight for females, okay? And we know when this event occurs. Now, you can see the hash marks there in the middle of the painting, okay? And when you count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, what's ten months from the winter solstice? It's October, okay? It's the month I was born, October 3rd, all right? That's when this event occurs. They were tracking when these animals behaved this way. The next image from Lascaux Cave, okay, which I find to be also incredibly interesting, is this one. And they're all this way, but these two are the most exquisite, I think. These are cave lions, okay? Now, the, the foreground lion is the male, and the, and, the, and the background lion is the female, and these lions are also in the mating ritual, okay? And you know how we know that? You know how scientists know that? Do you see the female and how angry she looks? <laughs> <laughs> Female lions do not apparently appreciate the event. <laughs> and you can even see the sort of like sort of yearning look they face the male lion's face. It's incredible, isn't it? And look, they they counted the months. One, two, three, four, five. That puts us January, February, March, April, May. It's right in the spring, right before the summer, and this is when cave lions meet. They were tracking animal behaviors 32,000 years ago. Now, these were the oldest paintings we'd ever discovered until about five, six years ago when a much older painting was found in Indonesia, okay? And I was there, it's of a deer pig, okay? We never even heard of a deer pig because they went extinct. It's a funny looking animal and here it is. Right? <laughs> and look at that. Exact same thing. And the, I didn't put that there. I didn't Photoshop my hand into all these paintings, guys. <laughs> that, that was, and in fact, I still don't even know, having studied this for a long time, I still don't know how they did that. It looks like spray paint, doesn't it? Yeah, I still don't exactly know how they were doing that. But tracking the animal's behavior, okay? We think that the hand meant 12 because there's actually 12 digits if you count them. And so they were able to mark which month on the hand. This was the oldest painting we ever discovered probably a couple, three years ago. I was sent this by a scientist because I've been giving this lecture now for quite a while, and now I have a, a, a pretty big network of scientists from around the world. The next painting, this one is the oldest painting now in the world. This is the reigning champion. This painting dates to 40,000 BC, right at the dawn of the cognitive revolution. And you can see that it's an animal. Do you guys see the front legs? 
back legs. You kind of see that it's got horns. You know, it's an animal, okay? It's a cow-like looking animal, okay? It's a little faded, but look in the upper right. Okay? Now I've been tracing this all over the world, and what I found was it's the same everywhere. They were tracking animals, not just they were all tracking animals, but they were all tracking animals in the exact same way. And what this has led to is a real revolution in our understanding of ancient hunters and animals. We used to think that they lived in very small bands of isolated families, that they were very unsophisticated and had very low population densities. What the record has shown over the last 20 or 30 years is that this is a totally outdated notion of our ancestors. Pre-agricultural human beings had a dramatically more sophisticated lifestyle than we had ever anticipated. Okay? And this is shown by the archaeological record. And it's everywhere. I don't know if many of you are familiar with this. Most of you are probably from the United States. Most of you are probably from the United States. Okay. Um, this is just close to where I grew up. I grew up in Chicago, Illinois. Um, just south of there. It's actually just, just across the river from St. Louis. It's called Cahokia. Some of you are probably familiar with Cahokia. For decades, they just thought this was a hill, okay? You can see the highway. I drove by this, okay? Just kind of looked like a hill until they started excavating it. Uh, Native Americans made this, okay? This is what it looks like today, but this is what anthropologists think it looked like back in its day. Cahokia was an enormous pyramid, the size of the Pyramid of Giza. It's estimated that over 55 million cubic feet of earth were moved in the creation of Cahokia. It wasn't just this central pyramid. It was an enormous palisade, a huge 2,200-acre defensive structure. Hundreds and hundreds of mounds, agricultural sites, irrigation canals, scavenging bands of isolated families did not make this. Hundreds of thousands of people lived here. They started taking this understanding around to Central and South America and found just an incredible amount of evidence. This is a documentary that just came out a few years ago, and it's so interesting that I've added it to this presentation, and it's worth listening to. So you can see as we're going up all across what was thought to be jungle wilderness, the LiDAR team is discovering the sheer extent and complexity of the Maya civilization for the very first time. Surrounding it, and it has always been astounding to think the Maya could sustain such great cities in the jungle. But no one imagined that the space between the cities could possibly have been so heavily populated. These squares, these are all amazingly buildings. You can just see when you peel the jungle off, look, it's just yeah. everywhere. So far, more than 60,000 previously unknown buildings have been counted. You get a sense of how much is out there. I mean, it seems like this whole zone was covered in human activity. Yeah. The whole jungle. But we thought were whole cities were really only the city centers. Now we can see a vast urban sprawl reaching into the jungle. This site, El Palmar, is 40 times bigger than we thought it was. 40 times bigger. It's leading to overall population estimates for the Maya world that are almost beyond belief. Did you guys catch that? 60,000. They started doing LIDAR to just a small section of the forest and found six zero, 60,000 buildings. This consensus has of the archaeological world has so dramatically shifted our understanding of the ancient of the pre-agricultural societies it was estimated that a few hundred thousand people lived in the western hemisphere before columbus got here that used to be the estimate the estimate today of the anthropological community is that they think there was probably more than a hundred million a hundred million people living in the western hemisphere before columbus got here most of them were killed up by disease that's why we never met any of them, okay? He just took out the entire population and we just met the, 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 the stranded, the stragglers, okay? The remaining. And this same 
understanding of the ancient world and pre-agricultural human beings has been consistent 